Made in black America, metaphor for a predator Been to the Mediterranean, all my papers like an editor I flow like a reservoir dog, rap Tarantino Off the chain like Django, still let the chain glow Where they bang no, and niggas get shot like camera angles In rap videos, put up on Vimeo Okay, alright, so we're here every week, we'll continue to have this conversation If I said anything that was disrespectful, hopefully somebody's feelings is not hurt uh, sometimes we have a tendency to push the, the margin with information. Excuse my voice, I have been running and tiring myself, and I did eat something I wasn't supposed to eat, and it always comes out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't go that far. <laughs> what, what, what I eat might be good for some of y'all. <laughs> Alright, so you can hear the mucus back up, right? Yeah. It's well, all good. We pay the price. Want to make your six month optimal health challenge confession? <laughs> hey, that, yeah, right <laughs> Some nuts, man. Some stuff I wasn't supposed See? to eat. See? Oh, 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 yeah. There you go. Yeah. And it got me. Wait, 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 wait. I'll make one video like that. Just... Wait, see? No. I don't eat on. I can't tell you what to eat because you might be at a different level of transition and it might not do anything for you. But if I eat on, huh? You just eat on? Yeah, to, yeah, today, literally. Did you eat them? I don't know. That's a trick question. I ate almonds, me. You eat them? No, I don't eat almonds. That's not a part of my regular diet. No. Oh, okay. So you went off the reservation? I went off the reservation and I paid the colonial price. There you go. There you go. That's a confession right there. We got yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what's up, man. Peace, everybody. Peace. Everybody good? Yeah. Excuse my tardiness. Uh, it's an it's a awesome opportunity to come back and uh, be in the Monday class. Anybody here for the first time? For the first time here? Okay. Oh, excuse me. Great, great, great. All right, so we're here every Monday night, and we come here to talk about civics, government. These classes are ran by the Aboriginal Republic of North America. And we are an indigenous government that advocates autonomy for our people on the grounds that uh, we are the oldest indigenous people on this part of the planet as well. And we set up something called a plebiscite to orchestrate methods so that we could regain our political sovereignty. All right? And what that looks like simply is we all participate in society right now. We do business, we open bank accounts, we drive cars, we do all of these things. Uh, we pay taxes. So what we're offering is that under the side of economics, we can show you where you can save resources, all right, and create new resources, all right, in the form of labor, in the form of what you call money, in the form of all these things that uh, are plaguing our communities, particularly poverty, the mental poverty, and the, the physical poverty, which creates, uh, by default, a people who get marginalized into certain categories in society. And then because of that marginalization, um, we suffer high levels of abuses, all right? Uh, human rights abuses of the worst kind. And since we have been here in the United States of America, in the sense of been here contractually and been suffering under these particular things, we've tried a lot of things. You know, we got all the evidence before us to look at these things. And it doesn't take extensive reading of books to look at these things, but a lot of them have shown that um, they, have, they won't work. All right? And we're going to talk about some of those things tonight. But I want to focus. Can anybody see this board? First of all, down. So Arna is here to deal with the, the political status of the so-called African American which is a huge topic, even though it might not be considered a big topic, because it's not on CNN, nobody's really talking about it. But a whole war was fought in said United States history over who we are, our political identity. It's called the Civil War. Everybody know what the Civil War is? Okay. So Civil War was North versus South, based on the fact that they, one party wanted to keep the slaves, one party said they wanted to free the slaves. All right? So that's the, the icing, but when you dig deeper, you start understanding fundamentally what was happening was your nationality was the discussion, period. Who were you and what would you be 
and other people trying to determine that for their benefit. And since that time, most of us have not been a part of any entity that is engineered to deal with that issue, which is a human rights issue, it's not a civil rights issue. Human right meaning you have the right to determine who you are as a people and then operate from that particular standpoint. So civil rights and all the things that our, many of our people fought for, even though they were valiant efforts, they're not the type of things that will solve the complex problems that we see in our communities. Mm -hmm. Those things can only be solved by the people who actually live in those communities and come up with those strategies. And we are not educated on how we can actually do that. So in the process of, of us doing that, what we're going to come across is some very unique things. And the unique thing is that white folks made Negroes. They did. They fashioned them. They socially engineered what we are calling Negroes, which was a name that was a, a misnomer that was put on our ancestors. Because we, we aren't that by nature, and we weren't that by nature. But they made this type of entity that would be best suited for what they wanted out of their society, right? So they didn't want the said Negro to be super intelligent. They didn't want the said Negro to know anything about her or his history. They didn't want the said Negro to come up with any social, spiritual, cultural, economic paradigms that were independent of what they gave. That was not the plan. The plan was to continue to socially engineer an entity that would be of best interest for the aristocracy and the common operation of whatever the society was operating. All right. So when we go outside and we look at our brothers and sisters, those of us who are waking up, we find out we're doing things a little bit differently than them. But in fact, we do find out that we used to do things like them. But something happened, we met somebody, and then we started changing based on that genesis, all right? That body of knowledge or whatever we met, which is a, a great thing. But for our brothers and sisters who are not making that transformation, they fit that particular mold, the Negro, all right? And the Negro is an obedient slave to his or her own detriment. And not a lot of people are interested in waking them up except for the people who used to be under that name or frequency. So when you look at your brothers and sisters, one intimate thing that you have to understand is there is no plan to wake them up besides what we come up with. That, that is fundamentally necessary for you to comprehend. Because what you won't do then is you won't unjustly blame them for being in that condition. As if some magical program is out there to wake Negroes up. It doesn't exist except for what we have been making. So if you have a Mr. Garvey, you have a Mr. Muhammad, you have a Mr. Uh, Drew Ali, you have all of these brothers and sisters, they came, to, they came, they came in, a, in a vein of time as an autonomous entity to address that particular issue in the way that they saw fit, all right? And that is important because what you see is that when you compare what the people who are not interested in our future put us in and the output, and the people who were, you find out the people who were had much more success as far as the quality of what they produced. And we're all the evidence of it, because none of us would be here if some of those men I mentioned, would, would, we wouldn't even be here. All right, that's important to understand. All right, so our work is, is pretty simple. But I mentioned the Negro because the Negro has habits, right? And those habits are not going to get us forward where we want to go. And as Brother Malaw was talking about earlier, there's certain things that have been architected inside of our mind that we have to address. 
So tonight, we wanted to talk about rites of passage, right? Rites of passage. And we want to compare it to what I consider, I don't, want to, I don't want to get anybody upset, but sometimes I do that, but I want you to understand where I'm coming from. The pseudo-isms that I'm addressing are based on a, a personal analysis and group analysis. I can't only say personal. Personal and group analysis of different categories of people that have sprung up post-slavery amongst our people with concepts that are not primarily rooted in the, the greatest success of our ancestors. And in measuring them themselves, they're not grounded upon good uh, thinking processes or actual information or good output. Mm. If you look at it, just Straight up look at it, all right? So what do I mean when I say rights of passage? I mean, if we were made a certain way, how do we undo those things that are dysfunctional, right? And how do we address what is most functional? And then if we, if we, if we can determine that it's most functional by experimentation or reality of some sort, then we can, we can implement it, all right? So we have to look at what's important to people, all right? People want to be able to provide resources for themselves. All right? So they, I mean, use resources so that they can provide for themselves. Excuse me. They want to um, unencumbered from living their own purpose, pretty much. All right? They want to have an environment that makes them more self-aware of what that purpose is without things that block it. All right? And generally speaking, people want success and peace. Some type of success and peace, whatever words that they wrap around it, that's what they want. They can use the things, different words for it. But there are certain things that, when we come to group success, when we are at war, mm -hmm. then we have to identify what are the things that are not good for us, not functional. So I'm going to compare rites of passage to a lot of things. I'm going to compare it to certain ideological ways of thinking. All right, because we can have some atheists in this room. I'm going to show you that that thought process is uh, not maybe the best thought process for original people, and why? And and if you got that from foreigners, sometimes you get something from foreigners that might be good. Sometimes it might not be good. Is that is is embracing that good? And then we have cultural wars that go on, right? I practice Mayat, you practice Islam. There is no synthesis in some people's mind. It's just two ideologically different things and neither one of them have any synthesis. I'm going to challenge you tonight to see whether you have been drawing from a pool of information that even gives you the ability to even make a comment on it. Because if you make a comment on it, you should be grounded in some information and say, well, yeah, I've at least on this level of study, so I, I know. And then if we go through Judaism, Christianity, Islam, African spiritual practices, Mayatis, Kematology, all these ideological practices, can we come to a synthesis that there's some groundwork that, that is useful in all of them, or there's some type of synthesis, or no synthesis at all, and we just gotta stay divided, because Bam was just talking about that. And then overall, if we are saying we're coming into a government, what expectation are we having of you since we are saying some of these things are pseudo -isms? That we got to continue to talk about and wean out. All right, so rites of passage. Put that on the board. Rites of passage. We heard a middle passage before. Rites of passage. Oh, yeah, I can erase it. Um, does everybody have that book list? Oh. Yeah, I don't want to erase that. If you got the book list, then we're going to erase it. Right. What does the word right mean? Anybody? Ritual. This is, this is a classroom, so this is not me just talking in here. We are all talking together. Ritual. 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 Okay, we got the word ritual, which has the word right in it. All right. Right. A ritual. What is a ritual? Something that you, well practice that you do, any type of practice. Usually uh, surrounding some type of cultural practice, 
traditionally is handed down. Right. A pathway. A pathway. A path. Beautiful. You're going somewhere. <coughs> pathway. Pathway. Something that you get from the creator that was, it was it's in you. You have that right, like how we have the right to self-determination. Okay, something innate from the creator. Consistent practice. That's what I'm Yes. Yes. Consistent practice. What is the purpose of that consistent practice? Make it to, to build character. To build character. And whatever aspect of character that you focus on. That's good. That's good. You said you said something? You have to make it a habit, a visual. Habitual. Train the subconscious. Train the subconscious. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm getting this because this is all going to synthesize. Here and then, go, 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 go around. The opposite of left. The opposite of left. <laughs> Come on. That's going to become important. It's like family and you family. might not know why right now. I'm going to show you why. That's, that's an excellent point. The opposite of, of left. But, um, to cement it into spirit so that it becomes automatic. That's deep. Go ahead. Spiritual programming. Spiritual programming. Go ahead, God. Cultural paradigm. Cultural paradigm. This is over, right? God damn. Now, I got somebody behind me. I see. To establish cultural tradition and custom. To establish cultural traditions and custom. To establish cultural traditions and customs. Okay, great. All right, so we got this. Right, so passage, we got this. We, we understand the framework. These words are all a part of this. Now, two different definitions that came out. To submit something into your spirit so that it becomes automatic. And spiritual programming. All right, so human beings are pretty intelligent, at least the first ones who came here, who've been here the longest, because they learn rituals from watching nature. That's our first observation of rituals of something that is a consistent practice, right? You look up, you see the sun, and it happens every day. Same time, or around the same time, depending on what part of the planet you're on. So now you see the sun is rising and it's setting every day. So the sun is in some type of ritual. And it becomes significant to the people because now they use it. They need daytime, and they actually need nighttime. All right? They need to know where that sun is as they begin planting agricultural practices, they need to know where the moon is, they need to understand nature. So the rites are interwoven into their lifestyle, their life period. Got it? Now, that's important because when, usually when people who are anthropologists go study traditional indigenous people who haven't had a lot of interface with Western society, they see the ritual cemented into the everyday lifestyle, which means no one has to tell them to go to church. You see what I'm saying? They have a, a tradition about doing something and it's like clockwork. It's just like that sun or moon or star or whatever is going on. And that interwoven makes, makes them program. They're programmed based on their culture. Now we have the same things, right? We have programming. Is our programming good for us? That we get what, in what we call the United States of America? Hell no. Excuse me? What are you? No, it's not. Most of it is not. It's good for the people who set it up, though. So groups of people 
through observation of what is best for them, set up programming. So what channel are we on? Now, these two definitions, to submit something into the spirit, automatic and spiritual programming. Big. So now, we start learning from white folks after slavery, and it, start, it becomes programming, right? What's the programming? The programming is, first it was, Egypt is not a part of Africa. Programming, right? Whoever set that up knew something about Egypt that most of the people who they were talking to didn't, right? They knew that Egypt had value, and because they had an agenda to devalue Africa, they could not let Egypt stay a part of it because that would show glory. So let's carve that section out. Egypt is not a part of Africa, and now you got Egyptians and Negroes. Right? So now we had people to combat that. Sheikh Anthony Diop, all the great scholars came and said, no, 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 no. We got our own programming. And our programming says that the Egyptians were black. Or Negro, if you want to use the word, which means the same thing at that time. They're the same people. So now we start reprogramming ourselves. Dr. Benz, Dr. John Henry Clarks, Malcolm X, Donald Elijah we get, we start reprogramming based on looking at the data ourselves. So if you say Islam, they think Arab. Right? Then some other people say, wait, no, 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 no. That's not correct. All right? So what I'm saying is we've been doing a good job at uncovering the lies. Okay. So let's start with oh, of the biggest lie in the universe. Not that it itself is a lie, but how it's being portrayed as a lie. Let's start with the big lie, the biggest lie. God. Uh-oh. Let's start with that. Can you, in fact, have a conversation about God and have it not be opinionated? I disagree with you. I knew you were going to say that. How can you disrupt opinion from God? If I can do that, y'all need to uh, give me a $60 million jet. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> Refro dollars. I don't need $60 million for a jet. If I get $60 million, we all could. We fed for 50 centuries. <laughs> I can break that into real hard assets. You gonna dance on it like he does? Nah. <laughs> I ain't dancing on that. Now, I definitely got gonna name, name, take the last name, Dollar. <laughs> All right, so can we have an opinion, a uh, 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 non-opinionated conversation about God? Okay, so let's, 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 let's try to walk through this because I'm going to show you that we can't. I'm going to show you that your ancestors could, but now you can't because this lifestyle is based on two things, opinion and belief, both of them which are destructive. You think opinions are good. They're only good with a foundation, a certain type of foundation because they, they, they support the culture. To, to uh, allow it to evolve naturally based on the participants in the culture. So, what is God gen generically considered? The supreme being. Can we agree on that, generally speaking? All right, supreme being, and that being could be opinionated into a whole bunch of things. God is thought to have the most what? Power and force, right? <coughs> And God is thought to be the determiner of things that we call events, which are happenings in the universe. So you got all kinds of names for God, you know. And everybody arguing about their God is the realist. And my God will knock you out. Not necessarily knock you out. Olo Dumare. Ra. Amun. Allah. All right? It also adds with the power and force that God is all knowing and ever present. Ever present and all knowing. All known. That's an ah, opinion. Let's go. <laughs> this is going to be fun. All right, so we got all these words here, right? And God is thought to be, I guess, one of the, the, the greatest attributes is uh, creator. Right? Uh, you know, we got stars, we got suns, we got moons, we got all these things here. And people philosophize about where these things come from and who has power over them. Now, your ancestors were pretty smart. I'm going to show you how smart they were. 
they didn't argue like we argue today. They argued based on having something that you could not refute, your best of your ancestors. So if we start talking about power and force, let's do this. Let's put some equations on the board so that we can understand it scientifically. Can we do that? And I'm going to use some very basic ones. All right, so what is the equation in, in today's physics, because we, we can even challenge that, for force? Anybody know? Free Lost Pages of Islam book for you. Don't look it up on Google. You got 10 seconds. Time, time, distance? No. Nope. Time up, because you can look it on Google. Nope. All right, so this is the given equation today. Force equals mass times acceleration. Is force times distance. Force is mass accelerating, which is movement. Right? And then force over a distance is the evidence of work being done. So if we see the Earth uh, rotating on its own axis, 23 minutes, 56, uh, whatever, on that, and we say, okay, that's work. The, work. the Earth just worked a day. Because it went a force over a distance. And something is generating that force. The mass is actually accelerating, all right? Or, or keeping a consistent uh, uh, motion. All right. So let's ask the question, what's moving the earth? The earth, according to what we can see, when the sun is not refracting life off the clouds at night, we can look up and we see these little dots that we call stars, and we see blackness around the stars, so we can pretty much say, okay, the earth is sitting in blackness. Space, we call it space. And it's rotating in that blackness. What's making it move? Now, hold on, before you answer, Anybody want to get up? Everybody stand up on three, if you can. One, two, three, stand up. You just moved. All right, now everybody sit down for a second. Come on, sit down. You just moved again. What made you move? Ali Muhammad asked us to. Okay, I asked you to, but could you do that by yourself? <laughs> of yeah. course. How are you able to move by yourself? You have the energy to do it, that's it. And then you can make a decision and say, I want to move, I'm up, I'm down. An animal can do that. Even plants can do it. You see the plant start out as a little seed and it's growing up. All right, so we're going to walk our way through this. What's making the earth move? Energy. energy. Okay. Energy is, is generic. We can just put down the board energy. Electromagnetism. I say. Electromagnetism is generated by the earth. I would that's say law. <coughs> law, that's generic. But we can get detail. Let's just make it simple. The sun. We know the sun because the earth is going around the sun. So it's obeying something that the sun is telling it to do. We call that in science gravitation. Right? The sun has some type of force and it's making the earth spin on its own axis and making the earth go around it. All right? That's important. Can anybody agree on that? Because y'all, I mean, we all want no disagreement. Are we actually going around the sun? Some people will say, well, the earth is the center. We can challenge you on that, but before we get to that, whether this earth, the sun is actually going around the earth, because some people could, I've been challenged on that, to say that no, the earth is not moving. You know, they made this thing up, and for real, the sun is actually going around the earth. But you can just check that by the phases of the moon, and you can just kill that whole argument. But I'm not going to go that advanced yet. I'm mm -hmm. just going to get the agreement that the, the earth is moving and the sun has some kind of power around it. Right. We, and we can, we, can, we can verify whether that's accurate or not. Okay? Um, the sun is moving. How we generically can tell is we can look at it and then we can take a telescope and we see these little dots on it called sunspots and the, the spots are moving. So by seeing, being able to see the sunspots, we can tell that the sun takes a path where it rotates on its own axis every 20 by 27 Earth days. So the sun is rotating. And not only is it rotating, there's a term in science that's called uh, um, 
local standard of rest that says that the earth has a revolutionary path. Follow me? So something is making the sun <coughs> rotate and revolve around something. And we can track it over time. So when you get into deeper levels of astrophysics, you start learn, learning about some local standard of rest and how long it takes the sun to go around the galactic core. Got it? All right, galactic core. All right. So now something is making the sun move. Now to get right down to technical data, let's just jump over a lot of things. Pretty much, scientists today can tell what point in space the sun and the whole solar system and all the bands in the galaxies, which you can see physically. The only galaxy you can see physically is the Milky Way. The rest of them are what we call theoretical galaxies, even though you believe in them. It's belief. You can't see them. You can see the arms of the Milky Way at night. There are four of them. And the different points in the year, you can see those arms. The other galaxies are, there's a, there's, a, there's a type of science that's used that's based on uh, radio waves to determine whether it's there. All right? So I, this book that I have listed up here goes through this because I have a whole section that's dedicated to what I'm saying right now. I'm going to show you some of the pictures. So generally speaking, by using uh, telescopes that bring visual images, let me, let me rewind. White folks try to make you think that they come up with something. <coughs> and they hide the fact that your ancestors already had the conversation. That's important. So all you have to do is find the conversation. And, you, and then look at the people <laughs> who are talking about it. And like, go back to the first ones who start talking about it. And then you can tell who stole who from what. OK, that's important. Because what I'm about to say is, is considered modern knowledge. The Sagittarius A constellation, Sag A constellation, is the galactic core. It's this point in space where the sun is rotating around. All right? Sagittarius A. And in that particular constellation, there's 16 stars, 16, that are revolving around they don't know what. They started using words like black holes to help them understand what it was. Got it? What's interesting about that 16, for those of you who might be initiated into Ifa or other practices in West Africa, you know that if you use the cowrie shells as a divination system, there are 16 that are used. And it's a binary system. You know, if the shell is facing up and the shell is facing down, it means certain things, and we call these Odu. Okay? So you throw the 16, and they give you ancestral communication. That is what you call biomimicry. And this is what these brothers have talked about. That's a ritual that's taking place in the universe on a consistent practice where these stars are revolving around this what. And we knew about it, so we took it. And biomimicry is a new word. Let me put it up. But it's not a, a new concept. Biomimicry is we look at something in the universe or in nature and then we re reproduce it to get something out of it. An example of this is, there was a little white boy who, who wanted to develop solar technology. So he made his paneling on his stem mimic a tree or a plant. And the he did his best to get the angles and everything in. And what they found out from his experiment is he was able to generate more energy from that little thing that they were using for all these solar panels. And it was because of the angles and the way that he generated the instrument to reflect the plant. That's pretty smart. You start following nature and you start getting more energy. All right? I'm going somewhere with this conversation, so just follow me. So, the Sagittarius A, A Galactic Core is known. Uh, the ESAN telescope has been studying it. They were trying to see if it was going to swallow something. And, you know, a few years ago, and there's a whole discussion, but they, they've been watching it for quite a while. And Carl Jansky is the scientist who first used radio waves and other measure, measurable ways, telescop telescopic ways, to see that the sun is doing all these things. All right, so that was known. 
I can show you in the 53rd surah of the Quran the same discussion. Where the Moorish or the Islamic calendar system is being discussed, and it mentions a star. At that time, that was called Shira, which is the plural of Sirius. This is in the 53rd surah, 49th verse. <clears throat> and Allah is called the Rab al Shira, the Lord of Sirius. But it's, this is what you call a broken plural. The alif at the end is indicating multiple stars. Got it? The multiple nature of the Sirius star system was learned about in the 20th century in the United States of America. 20th century, 1900s. And they learned additional information when two German anthropologists went into Mali and did a study amongst the Kita or the Dogon in the 30s, and they got additional information to say it was a third star there. The people in Mali, the Dogon, and the Moors already knew that. How did they get it? And according to this surah, the study of the astronomy was called Sidrat al Muntaha. Sidrat al Muntaha is a word that is probably more used from the Quran among Sufis because it's the study of the uh, sacred tree. That's what, that's what the word generally means. The sacred tree. All right, and the Sidrat al-Muntaha is what Muhammad was, was uh, alleged to ascend to learn his divine knowledge. All right? But, it, but when you get to the core of it, it was astronomy, was how he learned his divine knowledge. That's where I'm going. He used astronomy to learn his divine knowledge. And he came, according to the surah, two bowlings away from the source. Bowlings is the, 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 the language of it I'm trying to get to was Sagittarius. The sign of Sagittarius is a man who is a what? Minotaur holding a, a bow. Okay? So they're giving you astronomy. They're giving you Sirius. They're giving you Sagittarius constellation. And they're giving you how he was able to tap into revelation. So let's despook this real quick. I'm, I'm walking into you to despook and I'm using conventional crazy religion. Crazy religion, because religion is crazy. You don't get no crazy than religion. Niggas will blow you up. Because <laughs> you disagree with him. That's a crazy nigga. Now it might be just if he's blowing you up because you're blowing him up. Okay, I got that. I, I'm not against that. You're blowing me up, I'm going to blow you up. But if you don't believe in my God, I'm going to blow you up. That's deep. But my point is, those people who are doing that ain't never had a class like this. They don't get classes like this. So it means they're reading the book every day and they don't even know what's in it. Check, because they didn't write it. <laughs> Only people who are going to know what's in it are the people who wrote it. All right? We wrote it. So I'm giving you three things. Now, the reason why this is important is because the argument amongst my artists, I call them my artists, and this is not you if you study uh, Kemet for traditional culture for the rise of black people. That's not a my artist. That's somebody who loves their culture. A my artist is somebody who's faking it. They're faking it. And the key that they're faking it is they're always disagreeable. And they always want, and then you got the same thing in other groups, Islamicist. In their way, they all, they'll look at Kim and say, you idol worshiping niggas, y'all going to, going to hell. Can't wait till the day of judgment. And then my ass is looking at him like, you're crazy. Out, worshiping fool. Come back home. We don't deal with no Quran, no Islam. We don't deal with that. Neither one of them know what they're talking about. They don't. Absolutely do not know what they're I'm going to prove it. I'm starting the proof of it right now with the Islamists. 
because they can't have this conversation with you and they can't refute what I'm saying. Anybody got garage? Open them up, Google, pop up. Every piece of information is exactly where I'm saying it is. All right, and you'll find it as I'm talking. All right, this is a good thing we got technology now. So, you know, if this was the third, you have to wait three, go to the Red Library and try to figure out what I'm saying. You can look it up right now. And I'm waiting on somebody to say, oh, no, that part right there is off. And if it is, we'll correct it. I have a problem with that. Okay, so follow me in my thinking. Let's go back. Astronomy, we're walking ourselves through. Silver 53 gives a star. In the beginning, it's talking about a star that is setting in the first two verses. The star that is setting, and then it gives the name of the star in the 49th surah, 49th verse. And the first 10 verses deal with Muhammad's connection to whoever is teaching him. All right? Which in conventional Islamic history is uh, it's, uh, Malak, or ma ma the Malaikat, which is translated as angels, which is not a really good translation. All right, because they just elevated human beings. That's all. Okay. So, this, this study of astronomy, going back to our original premise on God, we can point to the place and space that's moving everything that we can see. That's my point. We don't have to argue about that. If something happened at that point, the sun would stop working. But that point in space, and you can look it up as I'm going, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna see if I can pull this up as I'm going. Let's, let's go into the presentation. All right, look at fact check. All right, one, an eternal force that makes all things submit to it, that has actual spatial coordinates of right ascension and declination. Right ascension and declination are how you chart something in space. It's just astronomical time. Was described by Muhammad. And I gave the actual coordinates of it. So if you're on a telescope online or whatever, you can look at this point in space. If you go to a planetarium, if you go online to Google telescopes, whatever, you can actually see this so you won't think I'm you know, making this up. And you can write down those, and even if you go to a planetarium, they can give you an aid who will say, yeah, we can point the telescope at this particular place. And he'll, he'll start telling you what I'm telling you. Okay, yeah, this is the Sagittarius A galactic core, blah, 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 blah. Okay? All right, so this, my, my, my point of contention is this, what, is this is what Surah 53 of the Quran is talking about. That's where I'm going with it. All right, so can, is everybody writing that down or screenshotting that so you can see it? Because I'm going to kind of move kind of quickly. Yeah, minus 29 degrees. That's the declination point. That's below the... Uh, the uh, equator, of, yeah. The spatial equator. All right. So this is a, a depiction of what what we have here, and right here is our little solar system. Okay, and we are going around in a clockwise direction, which is to our what? Opposite of left. <laughs> Had to come back to that. Brother was right. We're doing a ritual right. We go in the opposite of left. We actually are physically right in the opposite of left. But our our revolution is going this way, and that's there so it can generate a certain amount of energy. But anyway, what the Moors call this is Arsh al Istawa. Arsh al Istawa is Arsh means throne, and Istawa means power. If we have some water, I need some water because I've been talking for a long time. And you can see my voice is almost gone. All right, I need some cheese. I'm losing it. All right, so Arshal Istawa means throne of power. Right? That sounds spooky, right? <coughs> Arsh is where we get the terms connected linguistically, if you've ever heard of the term Orisha. Right? You heard that term? Orisha. Let me write it down. Thank you. Let me write it down. These two terms are connected. Let's write them down. Anybody know what an Orisha is? Isn't it like a spirit? A spirit of some sort? Orisha. Anybody know what an Orisha is? A spiritual force in, in the Ifa tradition. All right, and you have different Orisha. Anybody, can anybody name any Orisha? Shango. Shango. Obata. Obata. Ogun. Yemaya. All right, 
Now, my contention with that group is most of them don't know what those spiritual forces actually were according to original initiation. And if you read, if you read the initiation, you can see cross comparisons in other systems and you can begin to understand what they are. Most of them are relegated to, to astronomical bodies, which actually generate your spirit. Force. When you're born on this planet, and this earth is interacting with these other planet, planets, it generates force in relationship to that planet. So we are associated with Jupiter, the sun, the moon, these stars I'm talking about. We are connected to these things. <laughs> Gravitation is magnetic force, and it is, there's, there's, a, there's connection to that. Right? And it's measurable. But how we did it, how we made it measurable, was through right brain systems. <coughs> All right, we develop what's called right brain systems. Right brain systems are a little bit different than the technical astronomy. So we now call it astrology, which is a bad name to call it, but that's a right brain system where you get into using those energies to relate them to your own psychology, your own makeup. Okay? So you have Arsh and Orisha. Right? These mean the same thing. And Arsh is a throne. A throne is where what? A ruler sits. What are the planets called? Rulers in astrology. Such and such, such, and such rules such and such. All right? And these energies are what we study. A mother would say, okay, I'm ready to conceive a certain type of being for our society. Because they're doing what you used to do. So they can make a Ray Kurzweil, or whatever, whoever else they're going to make, and you buy their technology. So, mothers, we got a lot of studying to do, right? But we're still in this God equation, I'm not leaving it. If you take this word, and take the root words, consonant or vowel, consonant, consonant and you flip it around, this is just me just going side, this is my sidebar, this is not science. But we do this, we do do this in a certain way. You have S-H-R-A. Isn't that the word I just put up here? They're connected, all right? It's a mirror. So, the ancient Egyptians used this star and this, this system in the temples of Sinmut to calculate. And anybody who knows a little bit about astronomy in Egypt, they know, they probably know more about this one than the, than the other ones. Because the Nile, the raising of the Nile was based on the annual rising of Sirius. But we have, um, my point is, we can identify the point in space. Now the only thing that we can tell right now about this point in space that's making everything in the universe that we know of move. How don't you think about that? You want to say, if you ask me where your power comes from, I can point to this and say, yeah, all the power comes through this, filtered through these local stars to your planet, through the vegetation and the air and the sunlight to you, so you can exist. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to slow it down so you can get this. This point in space is moving your sun. Your sun is revolving around this point in space. And your sun, by having that energy distributed to it, can now distribute it to each and every one of your planets, including the one that you're on, and by the distribution of that solar energy, Ra, the ancestor, right? You have everything growing, having the ability to have energy and move. No sun, no local entity to distribute that entity. I mean that energy. So when you look at the, the systems in traditional cultures, the sun god or goddess or ancestor became very important. Almost to the point of when other people who didn't weren't aware of the system, they would think that we worship the sun. Right? 
But we did that because we understood the system. They weren't insiders, they were outsiders looking in. And we aren't crazy because we have been studying a whole astronomical system for millions and trillions of years before they came that they didn't know nothing about, which is why they considered us gods. Now look at us. We run from the sun. All right. So my point in pointing this out is I, right now, can point out the point. In, now the thing about this point in space that's interesting is that there's nothing there according to what we can see. It's just black. I'm going to say that again. According to what we can see, the only thing there is blackness. And there's 16 stars going around this blackness. Locally. And then the, all the rest of the stars are, and the arms are also going around this blackness. So they call it a black hole. That's what they attempt to call zero point energy. Zero point energy, the singularity, they got all these names that come up with it. And the reason why it's so complex is they're trying to find out how does a black point in space have more gravitational pull than a star? Which has mass. Because this object has, according to what we see, no mass. Go back to your equation. Come on, let's go back. Force equals mass times acceleration. Erase the mass, and you have a force that can accelerate, but it has no identifiable mass. That goes back to our men, because our men means hit. Say it again. Come on. We, we're not crazy. We're real smart. Our men means hit. We're real smart, aren't we? Ain't we real smart? No thing. So now, you have a force that can be ever present. Because actually, you don't know where it is, but you can find out the point that's making everything move. But it can be anywhere. Mm. Y'all saw the movie, Lucy? Yeah. Right? Then she turned black? Yeah. Damn, the white girl turned black, then disappeared. And then that's the way she was. She was everywhere. <laughs> now hold up. I ain't spooking you out. Don't mean God is everywhere. Let me, let me, let me go back. Let me go back. It just means that you can have energy displaced from this point anywhere in the universe. And with the right geometry, a star, that force can be attenuated and then distributed or used in that local entity. And each one of the local entities that have a design naturally from that design can now attenuate that force absorb it and use it for its own reality to grow manifest. So a tree, the example that I use, is taking in all types of energy to do trillions of functions. And it's designed how the branches are, we, it looks random. That branch looks ugly. It can look like whatever it wants to look to you. But it's functional. So the people who come with these orbs are designed to identify that force because they are a personification of that force. You follow me? God in person. God is in person. No spookism. Completely removed. There's nothing, there's no, there's no thing to worship. What you have is a system of laws that have been created by an intelligence and that intelligence has figured out something very phenomenal. That intelligence has figured out how to make a creation and then live in it. That's deep. Because as powerful as the sun is, right? The sun has a unique type of intelligence. Its intelligence is purely based on ritual, right? Which means it's going to do what it's designed to do and that's it. It's not making decisions in the way we make decisions. It is making some decisions, but the decisions are cyclical. We have the power uniquely to be a part of ritual, but to create ritual. That's God power. So now let's go back to this God argument. Supreme being, power, force, ever present, Determiner of all affairs, whatever. I'm showing you, one, you can identify the force that has power over everything in the universe with no argument from anybody. You can identify that. And you can identify that it's black. 
<laughs> now, that puts you in a unique situation. Because now when you look at melanin, you got a whole different type of thing that you got to address. What the hell is melanin? What the hell are these little carbon compounds that I have inside of my cells? Let me tell you, tell you a secret about melanin. I put it inside the melanin encyclopedia. Melanin, I mean, uh, carbon, according to, this is deep, let me slow down. Carbon, according to testing, is the only atom with no protons. Now, I'm going to tell you why that's important. Let's draw an atom up here. I'm going to show you, this, this is what you've been given as an atom. Electron, proton, neutron, right? This is what you call, I call this a closed circuit. And I don't mean in a way that you would call it an other closed circuit, but I mean it's closed, literally. It's not open. And we know from studying the sun, the sun has a north and south pole, all right? So if you were to draw the sun, you could draw it like this, right? But if you want to theoretically understand how the sun exists, you would do this, right? Because you have, well, that would be actually the South Pole and that would be North, according to how we use it today. And what's making this happen is a magnetic field is being generated because of something happening here in the nucleus of the Sun. Theoretically, something is spinning. So now, what's happening is you have these little things, and we identify them as ions. Proton, I mean photons, coming in and coming out. There's friction, atomic or subatomic friction, all right? And it's creating what you call a magnetic field, all right? So you got a vector move motion and you got this magnetic field. It kind of looks like an eight. Earth, the same thing. So if you want to understand an atom, you need to understand an atom like this because what physicists are going to tell you now is 80% of the atom is actually just field. It's field, it's a field energy. And the rest of it is we're trying to figure out what it is, but we call it neutrons, protons, and electrons. Now let me, let me break something down to you, show you how white folks know what I'm about to tell you. Anybody heard, ever heard of proton therapy for cancer? Yeah. Yeah. What is proton therapy? I don't know what it is, I've heard it. Okay. Okay, proton therapy is the ability to make a laser, right, to bombard the actual cells that have cancer to knock off protons. So you use protons to knock off other protons. Well, why is that considered therapy? No, don't get mad. I mean, white folks are smart with this, they just don't know how to do this in a better way. Because they know that an atom that's heavy in protons decreases in energy. we walk this slowly. An atom that's heavy in protons decreases in energy. An atom that's heavy in electrons has more energy. The electron is the field mood mo motion. The proton is allegedly something sitting at the center. All right, so let me tell you what a proton really is. A proton is really, and there's no other word for me to use besides this, atomic mucus. Atomic mucus. All right? So you just imagine this atom right here. What's at the center of every living atom is a black hole. What you call it a black hole or a wormhole. And the reason why you know that is there is because that's how that particular entity is able to actually uh, able to actually communicate with the sun. I give you an example. You will see what? You'll see the light shining on him and you'll see a beam. Right? Alright, so from pictures from the sun at taken from telescopes and satellites, you can never see the sun, sun shining like a flashlight. All you see is the ball, blackness, and then the light showing up at, on an orb. You don't see the light actually shining through that darkness. Right. Because it's not traveling like you think it's traveling. You think it's traveling like the flashlight. I might be confusing some people. I'm going to have to slow down because this is a deep concept, but it's not that deep. <laughs> what I'm trying to show you is that this ever-present thing, all right, 
Anything that's connected to it is non-local, which means it can communicate to other points without traveling like you think travel is. Right? So that's how you get to Lepidu. You are a thousand miles away from someone and you thinking that you gotta send the message to them like that, no. All right? The power that you use is there pretty much non-local, which means that you can communicate with them without, uh, without protonic electricity. Wow. Protonic electricity is I gotta send a beam or something. Electronic is I can be in two places at one time. It seems like time is not a constant. Say it again. Time is not a constant. Okay, if time is not a constant, it's not a constant because you plugged into the place that has no time. Right, because all is one. Thank you. you all right, know. so the instruments of time are what? Sun, stars, we're revolving around them. But these are all our thrones. Wow. The throne is not the king. The throne is where the king, the queen sits. The vehicle Bingo. So my point, my point to you is going back to this carbon, if you, if you get my mail in encyclopedia, when they use nuclear magnetic spectroscopy on carbon, what they found out is that there's no protons in carbon, and they also know that carbon has the highest attenuation force of any atom. Attenuation means it can absorb any radio frequencies, because it's an open atom, all right? It can absorb the frequencies. It can, it's intelligent, it's super intelligent. It's the most super intelligent atom that we know of on the earth. That means it can tune into a whole bunch of things. That's why it's used as a, uh, it's used on stealth equipment for radar. You put car a carbon sheet on the stealth bomber, what happens? It absorbs the frequency coming from the tower, so now it's invisible. It's really there, but then you can't pick up on it because it's absorbing all the radio rays from the tower or whatever they're trying to pick up on. But so in a proton therapy to cure cancer, are they trying to eject the protons equals to the carbon? They're trying to eject the protons to make the, the atoms and the cells lighter so they can have more energy. It's, it's an energetic, it's a way to you know create energy, but it's it's compromising because they have to invade, it's an invasive process. Right. So there's other ways to do that. You can eat, you can eat some fruit and you're doing the same thing. You, you're, you're ridding your body of protons, which is, you get larger and larger on the scale, you know, you start dealing with heavy tissues like spores and funguses and those things. All right, so my point in all of this is to walk you through a summary. We can identify the force, and our ancestors identified the force that has power over all things, as far as gravitational is concerned, gravitational power. They. They, they, they created culture around studying that. And we call it astronomy today. They made ancestors and they assigned those names to the celestial orbs so you would venerate the, the uh, ancestor or the orb in order to get to the creator. This is 101, this is simple. So Eshu became the messenger of Olodumare, right? And you had other Orisha that were, they weren't the creator, but they represented the creator, so when you wanted to deal with a problem, you dealt with that ancestor via the creator. So my point is, we don't have to have a silly, silly God argument. We can go to astronomy and show there is a force that's there, and we are electrically and biologically connected to it, not via a goddamn book. The book is only a reminder of what happens when you have war, right? You have oral tradition, people remember it, you're gone. They come in, they invade you. Damn, we're losing the oral tradition. They start killing people, let's write it down. That's one reason for writing. So we write it down to remember how to construct society. Hey, am I making sense? I don't want to lose anybody. All right, so this is all right. So this is really simple. All right, so when we come to the argument of God, let's add in, my point is, let's add in astronomy and defeat everybody. Now let's go to the atheists. The atheist doesn't believe in the God of religions, right? As a matter of fact, they say no God exists. And they're right in that those religions, as they are reading them from false translators, it's, it's a bunch of foolery. So you, okay, you're good on that. But you have not addressed the reality of a God scientifically. And then the science that you are addressing, you're using medieval renaissance people from Europe 
to qualify your atheism, who were secondhand students of your ancestors. So instead of addressing that information, you stay and you become a goddamn black atheist. What is that? <laughs> That's not a shot at the black atheist, <laughs> even if it is indirectly. I mean, I, it wasn't planned, but what is a black atheist? It doesn't make sense. It makes no sense. Mm. Because the reason why we can't go back with that because you're, he's, we created in his likeness, so how can we not be a part of what is um, the entire universally under that law and principle? Because if I, if I say I'm an Aboriginal indigenous, then that means I gotta be a part of the first, which is the, the remnants of the creator. Right, right, and it's not spook, it's not spookism. You see what I'm saying? So now, when we see God and we think God is determining everything, no, it's, it's energy that's available and now you have to use it functionally or dysfunctionally. I want you to get this in your head. There's no being in space saying poor, rich, evil. <laughs> that's not happening. That is not happening. What is happening is you have some beings that are more self-aware and some that are less self-aware. And the ones that are more self-aware, even if you don't like them, they're getting the power. And if they're more self-aware of you, they can use you. Right. That's good. Huh? So what now, if you become more self-aware of yourself, you only use when you want to be used, for some functional, as opposed to being a robot. Mm. Exactly. That's how you build a damn empire. You don't build an empire with a bunch of dumb niggas who atheists. Right? Now let's go to the second group. I'm done with you atheists. I love you. Come, we, we're not finished. That's just the beginning. Oh, um, brother, why are you studying the Quran? You should be studying the Madonna. Hmm. Wait a minute. Okay. Let's ask both of ourselves a question. You and me. Who did we learn these languages from? You learned them directly from your ancestors? No. Okay. That needs to be focused. It's not the only thing that we need to focus on, but we need to focus on it. So, which white man taught you Medunet? Come on. Come on. Oh, my teacher. I got my lane. Okay, keep walking your lineage back. Let's go past Dr. Ben and all of them. <laughs> and let's go to the white man that taught you Medunet. We're going to run right back to, uh, before Budge, the one who allegedly, I got to do a whole lecture on this, allegedly cracked the code, Champollion. Champo how did, anybody know how Champollion cracked the code? Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone. And what was on the Rosetta Stone? Come on. It was three languages on there. Uh, yeah, Coptic, which is Demotic Egyptian. It was uh, De Demotic Egyptian and Coptic. Yeah, well, this, this was it. Hieroglyphs, a set of hieroglyphics, Demotic script, and a Coptic Greek text. So because they knew the Coptic, and Coptic still were alive, they could look back at the other two languages and begin to decipher what the signs and glyphs allegedly mean. And from that point, bah, now we can learn hieroglyphics, the whole world, because prior to that, nobody knew them. Right? All right. So here's my contention. First of all, the Moors were the first people to decipher the hieroglyphics. I got the book in my hand right here. This book, you can pass it around, take it, write it down. This book, and it's not the only one. There, there are six more that I can't get my hands on because I can't afford them right now. Mm. And some of them are not translated. Four, four of them are not translated. They're only in papyrus. So you can't get them, and they're not, in, they're, they're, they're not in places where you can get access to them to translate them until somebody actually translates them. But my point is, let me rewind, because I got to deal with Islamic history. You have two main groups of Islamic history in this book that I have, The Lost Pages of Islam, that I deal with. And this information that I'm talking about comes from a book. This is the book. I did this book because I wanted to destroy arguments amongst 
Moors, Muslims, African traditional spiritualist people, and my artists. I wanted to completely destroy it, and what, everything I'm saying is coming from this book. All right? So, wh what am I talking about right now? I'm talking about Islamic history. Two main groups, and I use the conventional names without getting into technical names. Umayyad and Abbasid. Let's start there. Abbasids came nearly 200 years after Muhammad, allegedly. And these were groups of people from areas in Baghdad who we now know as pale Arabs. That's their lineage. And there are two primary uh, ones that did not start the Abbasid lineage, but they became powerful, Harun al-Rashid and Khalif al mahmoun Khalif al mahmoun is known and important is because the hadith that we see in Islam became very popular under him. He made Baghdad a center of learning. All right? So Jews and Christians at that time, for the first time, got to put their writings into what we know of as books. Because the Abbasids stole technology from the Japanese, the people who were in what we call in Japan now, and they got access to writing on paper. And they centralized that writing in Baghdad in some of these religions that we know of now for the first time in the 800s and 900s had their books written down for the first time. There were no Bibles before this pale arrow got together. I mean, let me, let me say this real slow. There were no Bibles anywhere before this pale Arab. I can't even call him a Muslim. I'll just say pale Arab got his scholars together and began to write what we know of as the Bible. Challenge me on it. Got a whole bunch of Hebrews on my channel. Not only did he do that, he got with a group of aristocratic Buddhists called the Barmakid family, and he took their traditions from the Buddhist traditions, which I mentioned some of them in the book, and he made hadith that was stolen from Buddhist, Buddhist myths. I'll give you an example of one. How many people have ever heard of the story of Muhammad riding on the, uh, the white horse, Barak, to go through the seven heavens to talk to the prophets? All right. That story first came from the chief scholar of the Barma kids, to Khalif al Makmun, all right? And he wrote it from a tradition in, in Buddhism that dealt with, I won't even name the, uh, the god, a particular god who ascended the heavens on a white horse to talk to the deities. Prior to that time, Islam had no history of that. And Muhammad was already gone 200 years. But that story is used as Muhammad's night vision and a big part of Islam because that's where allegedly Muhammad got his knowledge of how to do Salat. Now I'm only mentioning this because this is important because the original Salat system was based on solar progressions. Which means you, you didn't pray five times a day. You prayed on solar rhythms. That's important. That's a different type of Islam. What Islam is that? The type we don't know. So when you go back to the Umayyad period, the black period, you find out that the pale Arabs and the Umayyads were at war. Mm. And the Umayyads, when you hear people recite, oh, the Muslims invaded Egypt in 640 something. No, they didn't invade Egypt. That's where they were from. That's another contention that the book makes. The Mecca that we know of and Medina was not the home of these black people. Now, how many people know that in the 33rd degree of Scottish Rite, um, after you get to your honorary degree, 32nd degree, um, once you pass that degree, when you get to the 33rd degree, they take the Bible from you and they give you a Quran. How many people knew that? Okay, good. Let me tell you why. They do that because it's hiding the history. So let me give you the chronology. Writing 
as we know it, started in Africa in the sense of this epic of time. I won't start arguing about ancient American writing. I won't go that far, but I'll just, just deal with this bubble of time period that we're dealing with. When we start with something called the Pert M. Heru or the Pyramid Text and other writings, okay? And you got them in Sumer and you got them in, in Africa, Egypt. After that, invasions from, from foreign entities, right? Those foreign entities invaded and got access to some of the knowledge. They couldn't really read it, so they forced priests to try to read it or whatever over time. Then you have broken texts over a long period of time. I'll label them as Afro-Asiatic. These broken texts were mythical oral traditions extracted from the ancestry of these people who had been invaded. And that was their attempt to keep it in Africa and what we call the Middle East and other areas. The Quran became a synthesis of a war to try to compile the ancient text. After that, you got the Bible and all this other stuff that you see. That's the chronology. Now the chronology that you're given is in reverse. That you had Moses, right, who learned in Egypt, and then Moses got the Torah, and then, um, you know, you had the dispensations of uh, Judaic priesthoods or whatever, and then you go all the way down to 0 AD, then you got Jesus born, then you get him saying the New Testament, and then, so now you got Judaism, then you got Christianity, and now Islam comes later in 7th century AD. That's the history that you're given. Completely erroneous. I'm, I'm going to break this down. All right, to you. I have to deal with what you, what you, what you think and then come, come to what it actually is. So why am I saying what I'm saying? Part of what I'm passing around is the proof. Now, let's go to this, this hieroglyphic thing and just kind of give you some information. Because I know you ain't never heard that the Moors, some people have been saying it, but they don't have the books to prove it. I can show you in that book that most of Champollion's decipherments are incorrect. Yeah, yeah, it's local. Um, okay, so let's start here. Ab al Malik. Let's go there. Who was known as Ab al Malik ibn Abdullah? Abdullah. Actually, that's how it was written. And then Ibn Marwan. No, these are two names that were used for his father. All right, so who is Abd al-Malik? He is the first Umayyad caliph. He's the first person to call himself Caliph Allah and the first person to record Quranic writings in Jerusalem at what we call the Dome of the Rock and on papyrus. Papyrus. He's the first person to use the name Muhammad. So in the book, in the thesis I wrote, this is Muhammad. All right. I'm not going to argue that right now. That's not what I came to argue or present necessarily, but you can use the book to cite that. So when you're looking for a Muhammad, where are you looking from? You're looking at the one that was made by the pale Arabs, the one that does not exist. This is the Umayyad black caliph. What he did is he created something called Masjid al-Haram. Masjid al-Haram. Masjid al-Haram is what is called Mecca today. Right? But the original Masjid al-Haram was in Jerusalem, al Iliya, And it was what we call the Dome of the Rock. And there was another temple called the Masjid al-Aqsa. This is the place where you had the original Kaaba. All right? The original Kaaba was designed based on astronomical engineering. And later, you had pale Arabs who set up what we know of today as uh, Mecca. Abd al-Malik, in fighting against these pale Arabs at that spot, which was not known as anything holy at that time, because all pilgrimages were made, I proved this in the book, detail. I'm giving you some. The pilgrimages were being made to Jerusalem. So now you got Islam, this, this, this slick talk where the Qibla was changed from Jerusalem to Mecca. It doesn't say that in the Quran, it just says that in tradition. All right? And this is important. So follow me on this. So he fought against the pale Arabs. As a matter of fact, Abd al-Malik burned down the place that you call the Kaaba in Mecca. They literally burned it down. His generals took, it, took, took over and burned it down. 
All right. So these people were, they weren't considered anything. Upwards of 150 years later, you get a, a caliph called Caliph al Makmun, a pale Arab. This is the one who invaded the pyramids. When you hear people say the Muslims invaded the pyramids, the pyramids had been standing there for all this time, and in fact, not the largest ones, but the smaller ones went under reconstruction under the Umayyad period to repair some of the damages in them because they had the treasuries to do it. Khalifa al Makhmun was the one who invaded the pyramids, and everywhere you had Abdel Malik's name, as many places as you could, he tried to wipe it out. And by doing so, he compiled his scholars to, to effectually concretize the hadith to create the form of Islam that you know today. These white boys over there who call themselves Muslims know this already. They're not going to argue with me, all right? They know Negroes to take the time to argue with me instead of reading the material first. Now, under Abdel Malik is where you get the first composite translations of the Medunetar or the hieroglyphics. It was the scholars under Abd al-Malik who translated. Now this is important. Why is it important? Let me, let me show you why. Let me give you something to think. I can go to the Quran and show you names that only appear in hieroglyphics. Slow you down so you can understand what I'm saying. I'm going to give you one of the names. Names that only appear in hieroglyphics, show up in Quranic writings, which means someone in this period, when the Qurans were written on papyri, which only grows in Egypt. I cited those sources too. There is no papyrus in Arabia because it doesn't grow there. So the first Qurans, over 18,000 scrolls, 16,000 that are in museums, are written on papyrus plants. I mean papyri that come from the papyrus plant, which only grows in the Nilotic Sudan. Important. So they, they dispose, they, they change the geography of a black civilization that brought, I can only say brought Maya back. Okay? But the word that's used there is if if you go to the uh, uh forget the sur, but you can Google it, is Haman. Hamam was an official in the 18th dynasty. All right? And this word appears, when I did the, when I did the uh, it's, it's in the book too, when I did the interview a few weeks ago with the brother, who walks, who listens to Talk with the Titans? Talk with the Titans is a radio show. Uh, we do uh, Based in online the UK. streams. If you're on social media, just go to Talk with the Titans and you'll see this free interview I did. And I gave all the sightings. I just, I'm not pulling up right. But Hamam was an 18th dynasty official, and I cited the source where you can find this at, and it's also in the Quran. So that means somebody who, whoever wrote the Quran, knew that name, and knew to pull that name. Now, when the pale Arabs came, they got access to some of these books. So pale Arabs have been reading Medunetta since 900 AD. I need y'all to understand that. How do you know? Because when Caliph al Makhum got together his scholars and made the Masoretic text in Hebrew, the New Hebrew, all right, in the 9th and 10th century, you can go to the Bible and get the name Ramesses. That's not a Hebrew name. It comes from Ramus, which is only written in one language, Demotic script or uh, what we call the Medunetta. Who knew to put that name instead of some Hebrew name? And where did they get the name from if they couldn't read hieroglyphics? My point to you is people have been reading hieroglyphics for a long time. Let's stop playing. The Champollion aspect was to engineer what we know of as Egyptology today. The purpose of, of engineering Egyptology is so that you never know nothing about Kemet. Mm. Not by lineage. You see what I'm saying? It becomes an aristoc uh, uh, aristocratic scholarship for niggas who want to feel good about themselves. Because what, hey, what you have at the core of it is the neglect of lineage. So after the dynasties died, where did the Egyptians go? They all died off? 
Okay, so you're admitting that we're the remnant, right? If you're admitting that we're the remnant and you study Islamic civilizations, how can you deny the fact, once you do a real good cursory study of it, that these weren't the same people? Because we were fighting the same people. Romans, Persians. Here's where you make your mistake at. Let me help you. You think Muhammad is an Arab. Let me help you out. I'm just going to read what's in the Quran, even in English. I'm not going. I'm not going to. I'm not going to make it hard. Now, I'm not trying to make you become anything. What I want you to know is you need to be aware of where your people at. Because if you are a leader today in your own house and you want to overcome white supremacy, you really got to do it. Which means you got to be smarter than white people. By nature, you already are. All right. Just by being born who you are. All right, so I'm going to skip through some of this so I can come to uh, my points. Um, actually, I'm way past it. Let me go back. All right, so let me get this point out of the way and then we can, um, we can get to it. Muhammad the Arab, and he said it in the Quran. All we got to do is go to it. All right, so that's the real Kaaba right there with the first Quranic inscriptions. The first Quranic inscriptions were written in stone, not on paper. That's tradition. And then, and then papyrus later. So look, look at these verses. This is Muhammad allegedly see, receiving revelation from the creator about the people and the things around him. And look what he said, look at this surah. Because I had arguments about this surah, look at it. Because we call the language Arabic, which is not called Arabic, all right? There were two words used for it, kara and uh, shuri. Shuri is the word for we call Kufic. We say Kufic script. The real word was Shuri. All right? And the Quran will tell you that it was first written on Rakim al Munshurin, which is the word that they use for writing in papyrus. I'm coming. I'm coming. Because I got to go here and then I'm, I'm, I'm coming to it. All right. But let me give it. Surah 9, verses 97 through 99. I'm going to give you African history co opted. Pay attention. All more scientists, pay attention. The Arabs, all right? And if you look right here, let's go. I'm reading this verse. Now put the, the, the Kara script here. This is transliteration, all right? This is translation. English, transliteration, original language. Now, when you go to any of the translations, what you'll find out, Muhammad Ali, Yusuf Ali, Mardik Pikthal, all these people, they won't translate the word as Arabs. They'll say dwellers of the desert. They took the word Arab, I mean, Arab out, put English, dwellers of the desert. Because they have to uphold that Muhammad was an Arab to uphold the shindig, the bamboozle. That co opts you out of a thousand years of history and writings that were in Egypt, Timbuktu, and all these other places, so you won't know your history. And it does become political. I'm walking you into the political side of it. Because, let me walk you slow. I don't want to jump myself. All right, so we got it right here. Alif Lam, A-L. That is the connotation of the, the. Alif Lam, Alif. All right? Ain, that's a hard A. al Aru, Aru. A, Ra, Alif. That's an R, that's a long A, and that's a B. al Aru. All right? The Arabs, the Arabs are the strongest in Kufari or Kufari. Kufari is someone who is detestable because they don't submit to tradition, tradition that is uh, effective. All right? So you see the pale Arabs calling our people Kufari, Kufar. You're a disbeliever. That's how they translate it. But that's not what the word originally meant. It meant someone who doesn't follow the traditions. They couldn't follow the traditions because they didn't know. We knew. The Arabs are the strongest in disbelief and hypocrisy. And most disposed to not be truly aware of the laws of what Allah has revealed to his messenger. And Allah is an only and why? So if he was an Arab, why would he be saying this? Like keep listening. Keep, keep and of the Arabs are those who take what they spend 
to be an illegal cause. Why is that there? Because as the, uh, the Muslims, the, the African Muslims, the Umayyad, they had different names, Mujahs, uh, Ansar, as they were taken back over these territories, they applied something called, I can't even see that. That's like, back here is, okay, catch gotcha. They were applying something called the Jiza. The Jiza is, you're not one of us, you gotta pay taxes. So now, the Gassanids and the Lakhmids, I mentioned this in the book, were Byzantine underlords. These are your real Arabs. They were under the name Gassanids and Lakhmids. And they used the term Arab for them too. Once, once we broke the Byzantine and the Sasanian power, we made them pay taxes. So this is what the verse suggests. The verse and of the Arabs are those who take what they spend to be an illegal cause. And awaiting amongst you are the watchers. Among them is an iniquitous group of watchers, and Allah is hearing and knowing. And of the Arabs who will proclaim belief in Allah in the latter period, and consider what they spend to give, or oh, give to bring this nearness to Allah and the prayers of the messenger. Surely it does not bring them nearness. Allah will bring finality to their affair, which is all perceiving truth. All right? I'll just keep going. Now, it addresses the people who the book is actually for. Look at what it said. And the first of the first, all right? In faith, among the Mu, uh, it should say Hijazin, Mu Hijaz. Now, how many people have heard of the Hijaz, the term Hijaz? The Hijaz is supposed to be the place where Mecca and Medina are. All right, and it's actually not, but we just go over the term. The Mu Hijazina and the Ansar and those who followed them with good conduct. Allah is pleased with them, and they are pleased with Allah, and um, he has prepared for them gardens beneath which rivers flow away, and they will abide forever. That is a great attainment. And those around you of the hypocrite Arabs, you can see the word right here. I'm not making that up. Al-Arab Munafikun. Munafikun. All right? Munafikun. Hypocrites. And of the people of Medina, they persist in hypocrisy. So you have two, you have three groups. You have these Arabs, then you have the Ansar, and you have the Mujizina, which are technical words for the Umi, Umayya. Umayya was a term that meant nation. All right? Like you say, Umma. Umma means the community. The, word, the reason why the word Umma was used is because this was a nationalization process. Follow me? You get conquered, other people's traditions are coming. Now, everything we're doing right now was done then, in a different way, for that particular time. All right, so they were addressing it, and they had their text and their constitution to address how the Romans, the Persians, and the Arabs had invaded Africa, and the Middle East, where they were, where they were living in, all right? So this, these verses are important because they give you demographics of people. That's my point. And you have been taught that Arabs are the founders of Islam along with the Arab prophet Muhammad, and you are incorrect. So what the book does is it goes through all the geography to give you the clarity. Now, why is this important? Again, because later, the Umayyads, all right, who were from Egypt, as they were attacked by the Arabs, migrated further into Mali, North Africa, and what you call Spain and created what you know of as Andalus, the more civilizations in Spain, and these other capitals. So if you're trying to figure out why Timbuktu became the capital of Islam, is because as invaders came into Egypt, we exported the dollars to Mali. So now when you go back and you look at Mansa Musa, and you look at these kings, you need a little bit more knowledge about why they, why they were so powerful. Why Timbuktu became the capital of the Islamic scholarship. It's secret. All right? It's not so secret among some of them because some of the people still know. And this is why they don't want to talk about anything Moorish except that they can present themselves as the fake Moors, like these French people in Morocco are doing. You follow me? All right? So now, what have I established? I gave you at least one book so you can prove that we were the first people to translate hieroglyphics way before Champollion, a thousand years before. Which scholar brought you that book? Name it. 
How come they don't know the book exists? First of all, if you go to let white people teach you, they're not going to tell you the books exist. They're actually going to curtail you away from even have, having the energy to look. And then the, and then the Ma'at is definitely not looking for. They're looking for anything to trash Islam. And then the Muslims are looking at for anything to trash Maya. Madness. And for the Christians and Jews, you just gotta take a back seat. All your books come from Arabs. All of them. If they don't come from Arabs, go bring me the original Bibles. I'm gonna show you who made them. I gotta show you. This is my last point, because we got you want. You wanna know who made this? You wanna know who made these Bibles? I'm gonna show you. I'm not gonna let you get away. You're not getting away. You're not getting away. No, what? Let me go back first. Let me let me deal with this first. Let me deal with this first. Star did not come from no Jew, no Judaism. Your six-pointed star come from the Tawido traditions of what we call in Eritrea and Ethiopia. Christianity, which we couldn't even be called Christianity because there was no Jesus at the time, but we'll do it, we'll call it that because that's what they call it. You had Eastern Orthodox Byzantine Roman Church, you had Western. The Western became what you know of as the Vatican. But the Vatican is a Middle Age creation. There's no ancient popes. You just got to do, do more homework. It's in the book. You got an encyclopedia on this. So you got Eastern Roman, Eastern Orthodox, and then you got Western. Then you have what they label Oriental Orthodox Christianity. <clears throat> Oriental or Orthodox Christianity comprised the Eritrean Tawido Church, the Ethiopic Tawido Church, the Syriac uh, Church, and the Coptic Church. Now, the interesting thing about the last group is they follow something called Tawhid. Where did that word come from? Okay, anybody in Islam knows that Tawhid is the most important point because it deals with God. Tawhid is the unity of the Creator. Right? So ask an Arab the etymology of the word Tawhid. And if it goes back to any lands of Arabs. No. It goes right back into deep down in the Nile Valley, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and these areas, that word, the most important concept in Islam, comes from Africa. And you can't find no antecedents to it in these other people's languages. That's point number one. Point number two, last point on the calendar, and I go to this Bible thing. Calendar. This six-pointed star is a solar symbol. That's important. And the Tawhido Church is the first place it shows up. So when you go to Ethiopia now, you go to La Labella, you see the star there, six-pointed star. All right? And they'll tell you, oh, it's just an old symbol. It's a solar symbol. But, um, I don't want to do this. All right, so here's the depiction of it in a war with Charlemagne, where you have the Moors over here, yeah, the Moors over here. Uh-oh, watch out. And you see the crescent and the star, and you see one of the brothers holding a shield with a six-pointed star on it. Mm. All right? That's what I'm, I'm about to show you. All right, let's go come on in a second. And then I go back to Saladin. I show some of his shields. Then I go to Eritrea. And show, then I show the first coins of Abd al-Malik with the name Muhammad with a... Crescent and a star, but the star is not five points, it's six points. The first time you had a crescent and star shown by a Muslim leader with the name Muhammad, it had a six-pointed star. And we're, I'm going to show you why it was related to the sun. If you can. All right. So, sun, going back to everything that we go back to, astronomy, all right? So when you made Fajra prayer, right? They tell you in the Hadith to make it right after sunset. And then when you make Zur, they tell you right to make it right after noon. And then when you make Maghrib, they tell you to make it right after um, sunset. They throwing you off your rhythm. 
You think they don't know you? But when you read the original text that I translated out there, you got something different. All right, it's coming back up. All right, so I pointed this out. Need some, uh, some clarity on this. Everybody all right? Am I confusing? I don't want to confuse you. Now, I mentioned the Ansar because I have a quote from them who, they were in the area that you call Judea, and they proved that the Bible wasn't theirs from their own statements. It's in the book. All right. Here we go. You see that six-pointed star right there? That's clear? Mm -hmm. All right. Red and blue. Let's go. Let's keep going. Hold on. As I go through it, you're going to see. It's a little blur on these pages, but in this book, it's, it's pretty clear. All right? Lalabella, Abdel Malik's first uh, depictions of the star. This is a, you can't see this one right here, but this is a red flag with the six-pointed star on it. The red flag that you see most boys have, instead of having the five-pointed star, has a green six-pointed star. And this map was taken from West Africa in, in Mali. All right? So that flag was in Mali. That's Saladin's coinage, six-pointed star. All right, now, let me break something down to you real quick. Sidebar, six. How many, how many, uh, how many triangles on, are on this star right here? One, two, three, four, five, how many? How many atoms are, how many, um, Atoms. I mean, uh, excuse me. I mean, electrons. Uh, electrons. Electrons are in carbon. Six. Let's write the name Allah. Alif is one. Lamb is thirty. Uh, the other lamb is thirty. And the ha is five. Thirty. Thirty. Uh, five. One. Six. Six. The, the, in Abjad, which is magical divination when you convert the word to a number, Alif is one, Lamb is 30, you have two lambs, and then you have the Ha, which is 66. The name Allah equals 66. The number for carbon is 66. 66. So you got the God, the element, and the actual star that connects the God and the element. Then they give you 666 and tell you it's the devil. <laughs> the beast. That's their revelation. All right? And you go deeper into what six represents. It's a female god. Mm. The sun and Venus. The number six. When you're dealing with ancient numerology, represents Venus or Yemeya. All right, we're going somewhere. All right, we're going somewhere. Come on. All right, so the word Jew comes from Judea, which was just a problem. There are no Jews. This is what the Ansar said about the Bible. They said. They said this to the Romans. And that's the source of the Bible. The Nazarene, which is a, which a, a conversion for Nasara or Ansar, they were Judeans by nationality, original from Galitus, Bashantus, and the Transjordan. They also recognized the fathers of the persons in the Pentateuch from Adam to Moses, who were illustrious for excellence of their piety. However, they would not accept the Pentateuch. Pentateuch is an uh, uh, Afro-Asiatic term for the uh, Torah, five books. Right. Itself, they would not accept it. Now these are people who lived in Judea, who you would call Jews because they were in Judea, but they were black. But they didn't accept the Bible. All right. This is why you're gonna study other texts to find out, qualify your points. They acknowledged Moses and believed that he had received legislation, not this law, though, but some other. 
And so, though they were Judeans who kept all the observances, they would not offer sacrifice or eat meat. Mm. <laughs> Damn! Gotcha. I got I got all all you myodis, all you Jews, Christians, all y'all eating flesh. Here goes some people right here who said the Bible was a forgery forgery. They changed the laws and we don't eat meat. You know they on point. That means they eat fruits and vegetables. You know, they got you. They're way more intelligent than you. They can see the lie. Check it. You eat flesh, you can't see the lie. You are the lie. Mm. They claim that these books are forgeries and that none of these customs were instituted by their fathers. Gotcha. Now, check this out, because this goes way deeper. I'm about to show you about this Bible. When you check the source, it tells you that it's a Greek source. So now you're going to go to your timeline and they're going to give you a date in the 300s. There's no such thing as a Greek. Let me stop. Greek history is fake Phoenician. I mean, it's fake history. It's all Phoenician history. Let me slip. Which is an African colony. There's no such thing as a Greek. There was no Greek civilization. I already gave y'all some of the books on that. It's, it's, it's also in history. You can keep studying. Martin uh, Bernal, um, The Invention of Greece. There's a lot of stuff, right? This is deep. All right, so let me go to my boy. Y'all probably never seen him, but I'm going to show it to you. His name is Joseph Scaliger. And he came and worked with them after they created these Masoretic texts and other things to bring it to Europe. And hey, there we go. That's your boy right there. Look him up. When you hear people say the Vatican created Islam, what they need to get is that the pale Arabs created the Vatican. <laughs> then they work together to continue the fake Islam that you see and to wipe out Kemet. Their object is to wipe out your whole history. Now, when you start going to ancient Bibles, they'll tell you, well, you need to go to Eusebius, St. Jerome, then you can go to Codex Vaticanus. Then you can go to the Sinai Codex. And all these are supposed to be ancient Bibles, but all of them were written in the Middle Ages. None of them are ancient. How do we know that all, none of them are ancient? Because he wrote with his team of scholars all of them. Allegedly, writing them from ancient texts, which we never got a chance to see, that don't exist today. Prime point in research and scholarship if you have an original text that was later translated, you should have it in a museum somewhere. Like you can go back to somewhere you see clay tablets, then you see translations, old ones, then you see new translations from scholars amongst Europe in the 1800s or whatever. You got all of them in a chain. So they tell you, okay, we, um, we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> Read my book on where the Dead Sea Scrolls come from and who actually found them. There's two Genesis points. Khalif al Makmun, when he first created these texts, which are not ancient, all right, they're from Arabs, and then later inventions after a find at a place called Oxyrhynchus. <coughs> Invention meaning people sat in a room and then continued to concoct this because they know they have to. See, let me tell you something about a lie. How you, how you d deal with a lie is the lie is always trying to cover up the truth. That's the purpose the lie. Anybody here ever told a lie? You were told the lie to cover the truth. So if somebody finds out the truth, then they can find out your pattern of lying. But they got to get to the original source. You don't get to the source, you can't figure out how, how somebody is lying or why they're lying. So I'm mentioning these names so you can help. So what did Scholar do? He's all the, he, uh, Manetho, the priest, he wrote that. The priest Manetho from Egypt, allegedly, he wrote that. Uh, Manila's Astronomica, which is the first, supposed to be the first Greco-Roman astronomical text, he wrote that in the 1500s with no originals in Greek and Latin, and then said it was from Manila's, a Roman person who never existed. 
Let me give you a, a better idea how deep this boy is. Joseph, Flavius Josephus, the greatest Jewish scholar in history, right? He wrote the books, The Works of Flavius Josephus. Let me, his works come through this guy, which means that that whole work, he wrote the original Greek and Latin text, and prior to that, there were none in existence, and you can't find it. Let me show you what he did, though, for you Bible folk. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me break this down to you. This is going to hurt your feelings, but you're going to wake up tomorrow, you're going to feel a lot lighter. You're going to lose some protons. Hold on. Let me, let, me, let me show you this guy. You see this guy right here? That's the depiction of Fabius Years Josephus, and this is the last point. All right, I want you to look over here. I want to show, I want to show you what the Jesuits did in the Middle Ages, because none of this existed. You think Paul lived in the first century AD. All right, look on the right, right? And then look on the left. On the left, you have the works of Flavius Josephus. So I had to read the whole damn book to do this. Mm. That's a lot of reading. But I did that. I read the whole book, and I had to read the whole, all the books of Acts, all of them, repeatedly to come up with this chart. And what this chart represents is 33 people. Now, why did the author choose 33? 33 people that have the same names in the same places. Right? One is supposed to be a first century Jewish scholar. The other one is supposed to be the one who made Christ's name popular. They met the same people in the same cities at the same time and never mentioned each other. Break it down. Paul was in 33 different places interacting with people by the name over here on the right. And I got the whole chart. This is this part of it. If I keep going, it will show you different names. Over here, you got Josephus going to the same cities, same people he met. Now, Josephus was supposed to be a real person who lived. Paul is a biblical figure. Josephus, as a real person, wrote the works of Flavius Josephus, which people who study chronology used to say, this war happened, you see the Hebrew Israelites out there, this war happened, see, it's in the words of Flavius and Josephus and it's in the Bible. So it gotta be right. Because how do people in the Bible know Josephus wrote it? But the same person wrote it. That bad? Hmm? <laughs> the same person wrote it. So now you over here in the Bible thinking Paul is a real person and that he made Jesus' name known to the world. Neither Paul nor Jesus existed. Then you over here, on the, on the left, using Flavius Josephus as a reference for world history, and he never existed. Then when you find out who brought us both materials, well, he didn't bring us both, he edited the Bible stuff, but he brought us the works of Josephus, you find out it was a, it was a 16th century Jesuit and his scholars who sat down and made this bullshit up. Yeah, they made it up. So, Brother Ali, why does the Bible and Quran mention similar figures? The Bible is referencing Quranic figures for a reason, to distort them. Well, what about Moses? Uh, did these people exist? <clears throat> Were these real events? This is called the Tempest Tale. The Tempest Tale is a 17th, 18th dynasty. I'll use that term because I don't have another term to use right now. That's what most people use. They use dynasties. 17th, 18th dynasty document of Amos the first. Amos. All right. So let's put his name, the root of his name down. It will look like this, like an M. Some people say it's a foxtail. Some people say it's like water dripping from three different fountains. I'm not going to argue that point. But this word, if I were to write it out, is usually said to be mess, but I only use the vowel, so I just put ms. All right? And then you have ia or ya. Now, some Egyptologists put the Yah before the Mus, and they come up with Ah, which is a, a, transla a translation, Amos, all right? They take the Y off, and they just put 
I and they put O S, uh, 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 E and an O in. I'm O is the first. Some say no, that's incorrect because that determinative should come at the end and it should be Musa. So how do you say Moses in so-called Arabic? Musa. Now you can play with this because the Y, the Y, which is an I sound, you get Messiah. Messiah. Where you get the word Messiah. So I'm showing you the etymology of all these words come from a source. But Amos the first wrote the Tempest Stele because, let me give you a backdrop. Amos the first and his brother, Kamos, rebelled against the Pharaoh of the Hyksos and the Nubians. That's important. The people in Tymeri were fighting people in the north and the south. I have it in the book, all the sources. So they fought the Hyksos Pharaoh, and they fought the Nubians, who allied with the Hyksos against the Egyptians. So, this is, this is why stuff can get confusing. You, 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 you're, you're a Kemite? Which one? Which one are you? A Hyksos? A regular Kemite, Tymeric? A Nubian? Which one? Because they all fought each other. So which one are you? You have to, you, and then you gotta look at the culture of which one. And you start calling yourself names and you don't even know what came from what and what came from who. So we gotta take our time, that's my point. We gotta take our time. But this Tempest they lay talks about a natural disaster in Egypt. And the natural disaster, according to geologists, is related to Mount Thera and an eruption that actually caused a destruction in Kemet and Amos the first records it. This destruction was related uh, in time to his wars with the Hyksos and the Nubians. And it caused migrations out of the area that they were at into the Sinai for protection. You call this, this story in religious literature, it's just made real spooky. Because Moses was a Neb, E, in Quranic literature, and he was the Neb in Tymeric literature. Neb means what? Anybody? King. King. That's it. <clears throat> so when you say the, the so called Arabic word Nebi or Nabi, they say it means prophet, but it actually just means a king. So all these people are kings. Muhammad and all these people, they're kings. Etymology goes right back to the source because they were using, again, hieroglyphic characters to write in their local script. So they took from what their ancestors wrote. That's why you have the name Nabi and Neb connected. But my point is, I have a whole section in this book that's detailed that shows that that event existed. And this is why you have 18 dynasty names mentioned in the interface between Musa, all right, the Firun at the time, and um, that, that, that whole dynamic. That whole dynamic was taken from the Tempest Stele, which was accessible to the scribes who came under Islam, put into Quranic literature as a reminder of the rebellion. Now, I want you to think about something. You're fighting against the Romans, and my last point, you're fighting against the Romans and the Sasanians who were invaders, who invaded and destroyed your ancestral kingdom. Wouldn't it be iconic for you to pull up a figure in your literature that reminds you of the importance of the rebellion that you are about to slay against the people who were invaders of his kingdom too? So that's like us pulling the Garvey back up, making him a trophy, and saying, we're going to follow how Garvey did this thing. If we wrote a book about Garvey in a thousand years from now, they took it from us, and people started fighting over whether we are Garveyites tonight, that would be a dumbass argument. So my point in contention is that the Moorish ancestors at that particular time pulled up iconic figures from their past and made them trophies and put it together in a package that you would call the Quran today. And these figures were figures, for lack of a better word, that were Afro-Canaanite figures. And this is when you got to get into a little bit of detail study. That's not important. The important part is the methodology that was you. Last point on calendars. 
When you go to the 18th Surah, 25th verse, I'm going to blow you away with this one. You get a depiction from Muhammad of the calendar of his people versus the calendar of the people who were outsiders who had gained influence, the Gasnids and the Lachmans. And it's about, uh, the, the title of the Surah 18 is Al Kaf, the cave. And he's calculating how much time these mythical people had lived in this cave. And he gives the number. They stayed there 300. And, he, and the verse goes on to say, and they, talking about the outsiders, add nine. So that would be 300 versus 309. Which were two calendars that were operating at that time. The Gastonians and the Lachmans had a 354-day lunar calendar. I put this in the book and highlighted it. And the Umiyas had a 365.25-day calendar that was based on the sun. Sun, moon. Not only did they have this 365-day calendar that was proved in Surah 18, they had the star-based calendar that I mentioned based on Sirius. So we had star and sun-based calendars versus lunar calendars. The one you go by today, when you calculate your Ramadan, is from the Gassanids and the Lachmids. So every year, Ramadan is happening 11 days earlier than the, the day that happened, the year that happened before. Isn't that true? Anybody who practices that? Meanwhile, the original Moors practiced the solar calendar of their ancestors. <coughs> All right. So how they kept time was based on a very intricate, detailed science that you have to have high mathematics to deal with. And this same Amos is not only famous for the Tempest Dele, he's famous for the Rhine Papyrus. All right, look that up, R-H-I-N-D, which gives us our first tables of geo geometric math in the form of uh, um, trigonometry. Trigonometry. Trigon trigonometric equations, <clears throat> which they uh, tried to ascribe to the Greeks, right? Which we didn't exist. But they show up here, right? Okay. And there's other things in there that are important. So why do we why do we do this particular lecture? We need to have a focus. Rites of passage is different than these fake things I'm talking about. The purpose of rites of passage, right, is to get us with enough intelligence as a government, a group, to undo the colonization systematically in a political entity, right? where we're not only dealing with the scholarship, but we're dealing with the resources and other things that are associated with that. Which means, when you start uncovering your material, and we start writing these books, this is just one aspect of what you call changing economic infrastructure. Because if our information is better, it becomes the resource. How much money is being spent on Ramadan with niggas buying fake Qurans from Arabs and books on feet and jurisprudence and how to marry and all that, all the stuff that they have. How much money is this been on? From now on, they're gonna come to us. That's my point. They're gonna come to us because it's just time. So the resources are going to shift. The idea behind the government aspect is to put us in something real so that we don't have to go to a church or a synagogue or a mosque or some shule and be dumbed down. And then go back and pay taxes to the same people who are robbing us of our resources. Follow me? So most of the people who are talking religion, who are talking spirituality, are still 14th Amendment citizens. So they're so spiritual, they can't figure out that they're slaves. No Orisha came to them. Allah didn't communicate to them. The netters could not tell them that they were 14th Amendment slaves. 
all this meditating and praying and bullshit that they're doing, they can't even find out the basic root equation that everything that they're using as far as assets is feeding the fuel of the destruction of people who are, aren't even born yet. That's how deep your goddamn meditation is. That's deep. That's real deep meditation. You're going in, God. The yoga and all this shit you're doing is really is working out. Now, I'm not trying to denigrate you, but I just got to get real funky with you a little bit because that's how you break through arrogance. It does not mean that we should not study those traditions because just, we just proved that the traditions are real and the truth is in them. But you have to turn on a different switch. Right? You got to turn on a different switch to unlock it. And you're not going to get that at European institutions. Degrees make you worse if you don't have a knowledge first and go in for a skill set to bring back to your people. Right? So we understand the philosophy that we are breaking down is not that deep. Brothers and sisters, we just have to continue to understand that we are the resource. We here. Quit looking for all kind of other mystical things. You are it. There's no mystery God that's going to bring it to you. All right? You got to learn these laws and learn your power, or else you're going to pay the price because somebody else is going to use you. Question. And then we can get out of here. Wow. You know the, the tar part of the, the, the people, I think, that, um, that they have to be able to use their tongue to get what they need. Tar. 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 Say it again. Uh, uh, you said the source goes back to God and other type of people. Tawidi? Oh, Tawido. But Tar, T A R, is the prefix? Or the oh, no. That word is Tar. Ta. It's, like it's like a U sound. If I were to write it, if I were to write it, Tawhido. All right, and the word that's the root in it is Wahid. Wahid means one, oneness, unity. And Tawhid is to to make to make you to make something united. So the Tawhid traditions are called the original Christian churches of Africa, but they didn't have Jesus as a figure. All right. The term that they had was different. It was called Kyrios, and it came from an ancient African king. And uh, the word that he they, that that was used for this king and the kings after him is Iashu, was a title that he used. Iashu, which gave you later Yahushua, Joshua. These are all the mythical aspects from the original concept. So when you go to Luxor, they have his birth there, and there's a scene of Immaculate Conception. We have a, 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 a queen, Mutamwia, and the son, uh, Simba, or uh, Amenhotep the third, and it's the first immaculate conception. But, so you know, you get biblical and Quranic immaculate conceptions in these conceptions, but when you look at the breakdown of everything there, it's showing you, it's showing you the most important act of a, a government or a society or whatever, and in the first panel, you have a woman, right, who's talking to Tahuti. She's, she's, she's receiving messages, divine inspiration, right? The next uh, panel, she's, she's uh, surrounded by Het Heru. The first Heru, Het means first, a woman, what I later called Hathor, Hathor, and Nun, which was a, 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 a netter or ancestor that dealt with fashioning entities, because she's about to give birth. And then they have panels where she's with the midwives and then the child is born. So there's a whole bunch of messages in there, but it's focusing on birth as the most important process of a civilization. And then back the concept of immaculate conception, and then you, they robbed it and made it into all this crazy. So, all right, two questions, two. And we're going to make this uh, short and sweet because we yes. asked. Uh, can you break down the new star or the flag or the new flag? Yes. Break that down. Can you answer my question on how can I find my planetary car? 
planetary card. All right, so the flag, the new flag is a flag that we adopted so that we wouldn't be called terrorists by black people because they scared of crescents and stars. But that's not the real reason why we did it. That white symbol represents the sun, and inside of that you have an eight-pointed star, which represents the star that we uh, made a discovery on, Tolo, and it represents those two stars conjunct, which is a part of a, uh, a Dogon prophecy that we mentioned before, where they said that the sun had a wife star, and we are now in that binary system. So we made a con uh, astronomical conjunction as the symbol for our flag to represent what we consider to be a fulfillment of an ancient African prophecy and native prophecy. So we're going to use that symbol um, and um, draft the constitution, the section that had the description to put what I'm talking about inside of there so people will know. All right, so that's the traditional side of it. Um, the next question about your planetary birth card. All right, what the brother is talking about is planetary ancestor, birth ancestor, or in cartomancy, it's a card. So essentially, without making it all hard, I'm just gonna give you a formula. You got two tables inside of the book. One is called the cosmic plate, and the other one is called the world plate or just called cosmic or spiritual plate. And it has the cards and they're all in order. Ace all the way through, right? Then you have the other one, which is the world, and they're scattered, these two plates. So essentially what you would do is take this formula. 55 minus two times the month of your birthday plus the day. So how that would work, if I were to put mine in, all right, is two times June, which is six, all right, plus the day, which is 17. I did that, but I, I don't mean to drag you through that. I did that process. I got my number. I know that. But I was reading the card that's next to my card is something in relation to my planetary card. Am I saying that right? Um, I'm not sure. You found your birth card, now you're trying to find your planetary card. Right. So my birth card uh, is that, what I did right there, right? You got it, you found it. And then the card next to it is my what's, birthday. What's your, what's your birthday? 720. 720. All right, so you are, for lack of a better term, I don't like to use the astrological term, but cancer. Right. So the card behind, behind in progression, your birth card would be your planetary card. So what's your, what's your planetary card? I mean, excuse me, your, uh, what's your birth card? Uh, what's, what's on the eight of clubs? Eight of clubs. Yeah. So the card preceding the eight of clubs um, should be, I'm off my charts, but you can open it up and look at it. Um, they're not the nine, because the nine is preceding the nine of spades. That's one row down. Jack of spades. Is that, is that right? Oh, if, if, if you have your book, you open it up. You're in the wrong book, though. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what I say. Right. Okay, uh, I'm pretty sure it's the Jack of Spades. The Jack of Spades precedes it. So when you find your card, the progressions are you're reading from right to left, okay. right? So the card before it in progression will be the Jack of Spades. That will be your planetary, planetary card. Your birth card, eight of clubs, planetary card, Jack, Jack. Okay. And then because you were born on a 20, the two resolves to moon. Right. So that would be a double jack. Mm -hmm. So your planetary, uh, your planetary card and your planetary number card are the same. Your birth card is eight clubs. That's all, I mean, what it means is just like crazy because I mean you're gonna start going into it, but that's for a specific system. I don't want to go into all the explanations of it. You know what I mean? But we're doing our certification next week, so at 5 o'clock we'll be doing that certification. Anybody wants to take that, we can. Let's take two more questions and we're done. I, I, have, I have some black biology books. Uh, I don't have Melvin Encyclopedia, but I have it next week. We do have black biology. So as we break it down, if you want to come to the table and get that, you can, you can get that. Yes, sir. Let's take here and then come to the brother. I heard somewhere you talk about the of Marrakesh. Yes. I wanted you to kind of... 
Okay, uh, in this book right here, um, we put the entire treaty inside of here in its original Kara script. We put our translation. We put, there's only three translations have been done. The uh, first translation was done by a Jew, Isaac Cordova Nunez, for the, uh, those white founding fathers. Then a German scholar did a translation in 1933, Snookor Grunge, and then we did a translation. So we put all three translations, and we put the original text. The Treaty of Marrakesh is a deep treaty because it's tied to a treaty called the Treaty of Aran Jews. The Treaty of Aran Jews was a treaty that was made between Spain and the Caliph in Marrakesh because he, the Caliph at the time in the Moors, retook over territories that were Spain in the east and the west. So if you're into studying treaties, study the Treaty of Aaron Jez. The first Treaty of Aaron Jez, which is uh, 1784, excuse me, 1779, and uh, sometimes it's listed as 1784. All right, Aaron Jews. Aaron Jez, or Jewess, Aaron Jewess. Now at the time, see this is deep. At the time, Spain was, was, was uh, claiming uh, places like Mexico, all right, and other places. So that was called New Spain. But this was a part of an ongoing war. So the Caliph at that time took over those areas, and when the Treaty of Marrakesh was made, most people think it was a treaty with, only with the United States. And that is false. First of all, the treaty wasn't even a treaty. It was a grant, because only the Caliph at the time put a seal. Treaties are signed between nations. The grant was a grant of protection. And the treaty was a grant of protection for two parties. And you'll see this name inside of the treaty, in the original and the translation. Estados Unidos, which was the what? Spanish use of the term United States. And the people of the United States were called Christians, all right? The Arabic word for Christian. And then you had Almaricanus. Now this is where the confusion becomes. Because the Almaricanus were the aboriginals here. The people of the Estados Unidos were the white people. The treaty was to stop the ongoing wars that had been happening between the Moors and the Christians, and it was to stop the abuses upon these aborigines. This gets real deep, because the, a lot of the ports, and let's wipe out Christianity for a minute. First of all, the Moorish ancestors in West Africa and the aboriginals have a long line of interface commercially, culturally, before there was any white people here. That's important. And it's traditional and it's documented. So to make sense out of why some of our West African family would come over into the West is because they had polities and business here. And the war with the Christians was the Christians were fighting against the Moors and the aboriginals. We already got all the history. So it was a political move to try to sedate some of that fight. So that's what the Treaty of Marrakesh was really about. Moors presented as a treaty between the United States and the Moors. Some people say it was the treaty was done on this land. There's a whole bunch of confusion. But that's why we give you this, because you can get the translation, you can read it yourself in the three translations that were done. And if you can study the Kara script, you can uh, look at it. But it does have application to us, politically speaking, when we start dealing with nationality and nationality. Marrakesh. Yeah. I started with Aaron Jude, but I, this is the pretext to understand the political conditions of the 1786 treaty, which was falsely translated into the 1786 grant, was falsely translated into a said treaty in 1787, when it wasn't really that. In, in, the, in, in light of international law. And the German scholar pointed that out first. That's the way I saw I learned, and then as I translated it, I, saw, I started to see what he was saying. Like, this wasn't a treaty. So, 
That's some big shit. Big issue. Last question. A stateless entity would be someone who has no political affiliation with anything, pretty much. How, how nationality, as we're proposing it, uh, deals with our interaction with the United States of America is that we, inside of our own operations, we are autonomous, which means that that has no affiliation at all with anything with the United States. That we, me and I'm here, start doing some contracts between one another in honor. That's between us, that we have a dispute, we have jail society. None of that can be taken outside of that political jurisdiction. Our interface with the United States of America is that we are U.S. nationals and not 14th Amendment citizens. Which can, you know, without breaking down the terms, in 1868, they offered non-white people the opportunity to become artificial persons, pretty much. All right? So the difference between a national and that type of juridical entity is that a national does have allegiance, but to an organic law. So what does that look like? That looks like knowing how to contract. So inside of my pocket, I have bank cards just like you got bank cards, right? OK? I got all types of instruments. But my instruments are in a name that was created in my government and not theirs. If your instruments were created in their jurisdiction, then they have control over it. So now when I go and open a bank account, I'm bringing my, all my assets as aboriginal property. That's tied to me, that's tied to some trust entities that have uh, protection over it. So now it's about protecting my person, living person, and my property. And the government acts as a fiduciary, as a group, to do that. So I can still do the same contracts, get on the Amtrak, go on a plane, and do all those other things, but I'm using our contractual interface and our instruments to do that. Um, okay, so what I'm saying, what I really was trying to figure out is what country are we claiming allegiance to? Because from what I understand, America is a continent, right? Mm -hmm. But there are no countries in America, and nationality comes from uh, being born, or you can you can gain nationality from being born in a country. Automatically, you are you become a national of that country. Is that true? Well, I think I understand the people who bring that particular ideology, but no one no one owns land. Right. Let me stop. Start there. No one owns land. We only have equitable interests in the land, which means we use it for different things or whatever. The term in law is called, just for your reference, public trust easement. So let's take New York. Everywhere you have residents, businesses, etc., that's ownership, right? So police can act into it, the mayor can act into it. If you go down to the UN building, as even though this is cons we psychologically considered ge geography, we have to change that because as soon as you step into the UN building, you're no longer in New York. You follow me? So now you're dealing with, even though I'm in the same space as Manhattan, when I step into the contracts of the United Nations, I'm no longer in New York. So, we have to, so when you say country versus the artificial stuff, that was the ideology that was brought about people who were trying to deal with the injury of the fiction and how it injures you. But you don't have to do that. All you have to be is contracted to an entity that's operating on the land, like Navajo, they operate here in what we're calling North America, along with the United States. The Seminole, Cherokee, Arna, whoever. We're all doing business here on the land with some interest some kind of way. Our interest is by historical right to exist here, and it's called just solely, which means rights to the soil. In the sense of being able to operate political jurisdictions, because we've been doing it. So you have two types of governments here indigenous governments and uh, the United States of America and the federal government. So they all have equitable interests. They, they have uh, citizens or nationals, whatever one term you want to use, and they have property and businesses that they're doing. So people who teach that you have to have a country, they're trying to say America is the country. Um, it's just a landmass. That's not a country. 
all right? The, t the term country is tied to a political entity. It's not necessarily tied to geography, but the geography comes in because you have some type of right to be here, some kind of way. It doesn't make you special. And more who teach that or indigenous people who teach that are trying to deal with the fact that they want to exist here and not have to deal with the fiction and the way they've been dealing with it. But it's really simple. You have a right, based on international law, to create a political entity as remedy for the injury of the loss of your political status. So we could have Washington, we could have Arna, we could have all these entities. We could have the Navajo, you could have the Sioux. That's traditional political autonomous entities. The bigger one that has more influence is the United States. So we still do business, but we still do everything here. Um, so if you follow me, nationality is based on a political entity. So when you ask the people in the United States, what is their nationality? They get a little bit confused because they don't have the other prong of nationality. They got the just so, which is right to be here and do business, but they don't have the just singleness, which is the right by bloodline. So they say, I'm a US citizen, which means I'm participating in the political, that has nothing to do with blood, that had to do with contracts. But if you ask a Sioux, what is your just sanguineness? Oh, I'm a part of the Sioux, that's blood, that's me, my ancestors, and as far as I can trace it, I'm with this indigenous clan. You follow me? So African Americans haven't done that because we had it broken. We had our just sanguineness broken, so we became Negroes and all these other things. Our attempt is to reestablish that just sanguineness so we can still be honor, and then we want to do business in the United States, we know how to do it without compromising any of our rights. We should do more, more and we still course. respect the laws and the subject matter jurisdiction. We still got to respect, we can't just go do something and say I'm sovereign or I got to use my paperwork to get out of it. We don't do that. We understand, like I wouldn't be in a bar to create subject matter jurisdiction to have an argument with somebody and then be forced to go to court. And then when I go in, I'm going to tell the court who I am, but I still got to deal with that matter. I can't just say I'm challenging jurisdiction and I bust somebody in their face. You see what I'm saying? So the lines get blurred because there's a level of ignorance and irresponsibility. But on the country fact, country is just land and people are here. If they came here as colonizers, they're still here. They're still you know, doing things here. So are you nationalized by proclamation or just declaration? By proclamation and affidavit inside of Army. Inside, but it only happens inside of Arna, or is there, is there, can you claim nationality without being a part of any body politic? No, that, that makes no sense. No, you can't. It can't happen. It can't happen because then you are individual and there's no such thing as individual political autonomy. That is stateless. Yeah, sovereign citizen ideology, all that stuff is fake. It's fake in the sense that you're not, you, you just, you're stateless. That's what you are. That's, that's the legal term for you. Which you could be stateless if you wanted to, but then, how are you going to do business? Well, I, I mean, from what I've read, um, according to the UN, uh, on some conventions on uh, trying to prevent stateless persons or uh, just addressing stateless people, they, um, they, afford, they accord you the same rights as a national of the country that you're from. So, but, they, but, but when they say they accord you the same rights, that's the rights to not be injured and other things. When you start dealing with contract and you're a stateless person and you want to go open a bank account, they're not going to open it because you don't have the instrument. No, they say the same, every, you get the same treatment as a national. I understand what you're saying and I believe me, no, don't even believe me, know that I have went through that aspect thoroughly. And what I'm saying to you is, if you go to that entity and you say, I'm stateless, right? It could be by proclamation, it could be by whatever it is, and I want to open a bank account. And they're going to say, well, there's not anything we can do for you. And then where are you going to sue them at? Not the ICC, not the World Court. Who's going to implement the, the, the local interface? The UN doesn't have anything for that. So the UN is good for some things, but some things is just on paper. So how, okay, so how does RNF function in uh, relation to the UN as far as the policies or the we, resolutions. we address the resolutions as a body politic, not as individuals. But you know, the UN is always like flip-flopping on what they say. They are. They're bullshit. Okay. We so, don't care about that, though, because we're playing chess. And when you're playing chess, you use what's available, and then you do the best with what is available, and you exist within something that's going to bring you success. You follow me? 
So we're not looking for the U, if they, shit, if they came in here and ran the we're not looking for the U.N. to do anything, but we will put a complaint in to the ICC for the record. So there's some things that can be done and sometimes they're not. Um, it depends on what your drive is. If you're looking for security from the U.N., you're not going to get a lot of it. You can do something. So we're not more as far as nationality goes. No, we are. It depends on your body politic. Some, some, see, a body politic has its own discretion, and we are done. Yes, thank you. Is that, did, I, did I do a sufficient job? I don't want to cut you. Okay, all right. So we're here every week. We'll continue to have this conversation. If I said anything that was disrespectful, hopefully somebody's feelings is not hurt. Um, sometimes we have a tendency to push the, the margin with information. Excuse my voice. I have been running and tiring myself, and I did eat something I wasn't supposed to eat, and it always comes out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't go that far.